when we organized this, we thought about their anniversaries and ours being Das Kapital and the Russian Revolution and um, 1967. Why 1967? Because it was the centennial, it was the Montreal World's Fair, and it was kind of Canada and all that <laughs> kind of nationalism and the beginnings of things in Quebec. It just seemed like a good year to represent the 60s. And in the discussions we had with Sid and with Jeannie, there seemed to be a distinct lack of interest in 1867 <laughs> and 1917 and a great deal of debate around the significance of 1967 and the 60s, etc. We also realized that both Jeannie and Sid were Americans and kind of missed some of the Canadian nationalist hoopla of 1967. Although, they certainly live in the reality now, where if you read BC Book World, there's a review of a book by Tom Hawthorne on Expo 67, the year that made Canada great and Canadians believe in themselves and all the rest of that. So there's a fair amount of significance. And I have a suspicion, talking to our two speakers, that that's what we're going to be talking about more, more about the 60s than anything else. And that's fair, seeing we covered both 1867 and 1917 in the first plenary. So we'll let Sid Schneid and Jeannie Kamens go at it. Who's going first? I'm on first. You're on first? Who's on second? No. What's on third? No, no, he's a shortstop. <laughs> okay, terrific. Okay. The title of this workshop is 1867, 1917, and 1967, and I was chosen to talk about 1967 <laughs> since I had lived the summer of love. And incidentally, that was the year I moved to Canada to escape the violence of America. It was also the year Shea was murdered. I came to Canada in a car painted with flowers and nudes and mythical beans. I had covered the car with a flat black washable poster paint before I crossed the border. <laughs> we arrived, rented a place in Kitsilano, re <laughs> repainted the apartment and turned an unused space into an extra room for my eight-month-old baby. We began to settle in and went to a car wash place and removed the black poster paint from the car. When we paid our second month's rent, we were evicted for being hippies. I had moved here from Los Angeles, and of course I did have a long career as an alternative person. I was one of the first members of SNCC at UCLA before I got kicked out for being white. And me, when in high school I had refused to join the B'nai B'rith because they wouldn't let non-Jews in. I marched to save the Rosenbergs, fought against Jim Crow, and joined the ACLU. I painted anti-Vietnam art on hoardings around the city, and I went to the Unitarian Church where all the radicals went, and cheered Paul Robeson along with the rest of the community. All in all, a typical red typer baby's life. In fact, if Sid weren't younger than I, we might have known each other back in the old country. Once I arrived in Canada, I continued to be I could never obstreperous <laughs> and put the, my then husband through school by taking in underage youths who had hitched here from all over Canada to enjoy the wildlife on Fourth Avenue. I fought Harold Kidd, yes, the honey man, who was the head of the reactionary Kitsilano Ratepayers Association and who was always being asked by the press about what the people of Kits thought of hippies. I lived the summer of love, but 1967, the summer of love, isn't really a year, it's an idea. It represents an immense moment of change in the world. Beginning after World War II, throughout the world there arose independent and liberation struggles for self-determination. They were primarily a struggle for democracy. The struggle for democracy is primarily, you can't, you can't say anything against what I say. <laughs> 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 no 
<laughs> Sorry, I only make notes when I'm going to complain. The struggle for democracy is primarily a political struggle on how to form a government which involves the reconstruction of the state. Democracy doesn't necessarily indicate an interest in creating social emancipation. Rather, it wants to set the stage for creating conditions for emancipatory projects. Although liberation is ultimately a democratic struggle, the tension between political democracy and social eman emancipation consistently beleaguers the liberation and independent movements. This tension inevitably involves the ideological confrontation between the two superpowers. The confrontation not only disfigures the liberation and democratic discourse, but turns fledgling independent states into pawns. Today's failed states were once upon a time the darlings of revolution. In Africa in the 60s and 70s, military coups became the order of the day, opposing the nationalist regimes which were trying to carve out independent states. Between 1956 and the end of 85, there were 60 successful coups in Africa, an average of two every year. By 1986, out of some 50 African states, there were only 18 under civilian rule. Behind virtually every coup was the hand of one or the other imperial power, more often than not the U.S., overthrowing nationalist regimes and installing tyrannical dictatorships was considered fair game for today's champions of democracy and good governance. Latin America, from the late 50s to present, the United States has involved themselves in the domestic affairs of every Latin American state. They have attempted to either strengthen cooperative governments or weaken ones that demonstrate geopolitical independence. They were more interested in political obedience than concerns about democracy, human rights, or economic development, and have supported a long list of brutal dictators engaged in covert backing for insurgent groups and military cabals. Ultimately, U.S. concerns is only about the spread of communism. In Brazil, in Brazil, it's believed that the U.S. backed military rebels, the U.S. backed military rebels to overflow, overthrow Joa Goulart. Brazil's president with ties to communism. When the, this rebellion succeeded, it threw Brazil into the hands of a brutal military dictator who ravaged the country for dictator, decades. Uh, the same story played out in Guatemala. The same scene can be studied in Nicaragua, where U.S. supported Samosa, who held absolute power in Nicaragua, and although his reign was one of violence, the United States favored him over the Sandinistas, rebels with communist leading ideologies. Cuba might have had a chance if it weren't for the embargoes which forced Castro to the Soviet Union, and a Marxist Chile might have had worked if, it, if they hadn't shot Allende. While back here during the 60s, it was still peace, love, and good vibes, and there was so much we were doing that was good because of the civil rights movement and the black power movements and the support of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It prohibited unequal application of voter registration requirements racial segregation in schools, employment, and public accommodations. From this came the entire anti-racist laws that eventually ended with a black president. Not that it made any difference. <laughs> there was the women's movement and the women's rights and sexual liberation movement, the back to the landers, the anti-nuclear movement, ban the bomb, the anti-Vietnam war movement. But ultimately, these were all false gods. Their effect on society did not deal with the one thing that, to quote Naomi Klein, changes everything. It was the rise of environmentalism. The environment 
movement coalesced around two books published during the 60s. The first was the publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962, which brought environmental concerns to the American public, especially problems that were caused by synthetic pesticides. The second was The Population Bomb by Paul and his wife, Anne Ehrlich, who went uncredited because the publisher thought only a single author, needless to say the man, should be credited. When Silent Spring was published, it was met with fierce op opposition by chemical companies, but ultimately it did cause a reversal in national pesticide policy and led to a nationwide ban on DDT for agriculture uses. And it inspired an environmental movement that led to the creation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The population bomb warned of mass starvation of humans due to overpopulation, as well as other major societal upheavals, and advocated immediate action to limit population growth. The book ultimately was criticized for its alarmist tone and for its inaccurate predictions, but the early insisted that their book did achieve their goals because it alerted people to the importance of environmental issues and brought human numbers into the debate. Although these books got people thinking about the environment over the past few decades, there have been few changes to our fast degrading earth. Here are a few examples. The mountain pine beetle has caused the destruction of millions of acres of ponderosa and lodgepole pine trees, including more than 16 million of the 55 million hectares of forests in British Columbia. Normally, these insects play an important role in the life of a forest, attacking old or weakened trees and speeding development of a younger forest. However, because of climate change, Unusually hot, dry summers and mild winters throughout the boreal forests of North America were experiencing an unprecedented epidemic. It is believed that climate change, monoculture replanting, introduction of invasive species, and a century of forest fire suppressions have contributed to the size and severity of these dieouts. Um, goes on. With the absence of trees, catastrophic, catastrophic changes in the atmosphere will result. There will be significantly higher amounts of carbon dioxide in the air and lower amounts of oxygen. The air would also be full of airborne particles and pollutants like carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide, and its temperature would probably increase to 12 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if the air degradation hadn't already wiped out everything, the next consequence would be of the this deforestation would be the effects on soil. Um, the soil would be vulnerable to re reduction in soil quality and topsoil nutrients, and eventually all the soil will lose its arability and agriculture will fail. Why stop there? there there are water issues from fracking, pesticides from the loss of the bees who provide three, a third of our food. Without honeybees, there'll be no more apples, pears, peaches, almonds, okra. Whoever wanted it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Alfalfa, okra. beans. Okra. <laughs> now I have to throw in the kicker. I don't believe that survival is possible. Although... Gary said something really interesting in the last one. It's made me change my view. I believe that the flaw is in the human animal itself. I think that originally our survival instincts depended upon us having a healthy fear of the other, strangers. If we could see strangers as ourselves, we might have hope. But we've always had the scapegoat, the red herring. Secondarily, humans don't have the ability to think long term. No matter the data, they can't act to stop the inevitable result of what they're doing. I look at Richmond and see the developers building at a ferocious rate when they know the oceans will cover much of the lower man mainland within 30 to 50 years. And lastly, we must rise above our baser 
instincts and face the truth, not counting the billions of life forms already here today, the people in, uh, there are 20,000 species on the critically endangered list today. People in Delhi can't breathe the air. It's obvious we're wiping out the bees, putting clean water at serious risk, and destroying the lungs of the earth. We've made a hole in the ozone and so many other atrocities too numerous to list. But we who can see the future have not been able to stop the Trumps and Trudeaus of the world. So what, we, so what can we do? To quote Robert Crumb, a hero of the 60s, keep on trucking. Or as I say, keep on marching. <laughs>